Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. It was about five years ago that we aired a video clip of the first hemp seeds being planted at Borderview Research Farm in Alberg. It was May of 2016, and it was the first time hemp could be grown legally since the 1930s. Hemp, of course, is in the same plant family as marijuana, but without the high. Hemp's medicinal properties are used to treat chronic pain, stress, and heart disease, among other things. Hemp became a booming business in Vermont and all over the U.S. when the 2018 Farm Bill became law, making hemp production legal. Farmers, businesses, and investors thought they had a hit on their hands and wanted in. Since then, production and markets have slowed a bit. It's not a bust, but interest has leveled off as bottlenecks in production, processing, and markets have occurred. At the recent Vermont Industrial Hemp Conference, hosted by UVM Extension and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, virtual attendees learned about an upcoming survey on hemp production in the U.S., the first such data collection of its kind in over a half century. Keith Silva spoke with a professor from the University of Kentucky who's leading the research. One of the things that uh, came out of a, a publication that we put out in 2020 on the economic viability of the hemp industry was that there's a real lack of data. So that kind of got us circling around with USDA and AMS, uh, the Ag Marketing Service that's uh, in charge of regulatory pieces for this, to actually put out a survey of all hemp producers across the country and try and put together a production cost because we're kind of flying blind in a lot of respects in, in terms of data needed to make decisions. So uh, this is in conjunction with Colorado State University and some of my partners out there and we're, we're putting together this national survey uh, that'll hopefully come out later in 2021, but we got to get through all the the uh, governmental hurdles uh, to, to get it released. So we're well underway in that process. Uh, so I'm excited to see what uh, what type of feedback we get on that uh, later in 2021. Has there ever been a, a, a national hemp survey at all in the U.S.? To get re really back to the to surveys that were done on hemp. Uh, in the past in the U.S., you know, you're talking about going back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s um, in terms of that. Now, there have been some other pubs by governmental groups uh, and governmental agencies looking at what happens if this does come back in, but, but really no comprehensive or complete survey, census-type survey of the hemp industry uh, in, in many, many years. What are some of the questions on there that, that, that you're asking? It basically starts at the ground level, right? So yields, uh, production practices, uh, labor costs, you know, we're looking at input costs. Uh, then we're trying to drill down a little bit into how you're using it, some of the equipment you're using. Are you purchasing equipment? Are you modifying equipment? You know, as this industry continues to develop and then finally look at, you know, what types of products are you putting out? Are you trying to do some pre-processing before it goes to processing? And then trying to suss out a little bit about, uh, not necessarily the type of contract you have, but what what might be some of the parameters, what are some of the things that are of interest for those processors. There's basically three or four lines, depending upon how you want to put this. You got the floral line, you got the grain line, you got the, the fiber line, and then you have the seed propagation piece that's stuck in there too. Now, whether you consider that with grain or not, you can make that differential. We're really ending this piece at the farm gate. So we're not going beyond that and looking at processor costs, uh, okay. you know, investment there. Uh, right. That's a that's an add-on piece that I would love to be able to do. What is the acreage of hemp in the United States? Do you have a ballpark? It's somewhere in that ballpark of 100,000 acres. So, I mean, you know, when you start to compare that to corn and beans at 80 and 90 million acres, I mean, it, it's so small. Um, you know, and that's one of the things we keep coming back to in the state of Kentucky every year, every December. We have to do a, an estimate of what uh, we expect uh, net farm income to be the next year or, or how it's going to produce. And, you know, they keep talking about hemp and how much money it's making. But in terms of, of the whole package and the, the whole ag system, it's very, very small. You know, one, two percent maybe of a lot of states um, net farm incomes. I think hemp is still is still in a fledgling uh, stage, and it, and it's it's going through a, a painful process, right? So we we came in out of the 2014 farm bill. Everybody was excited. Uh, we had acreages starting to build up until the 18 farm bill. Acreage exploded in the 18 farm bill. Then we figured out maybe we don't have as much demand as we thought we did, and, and prices slid really hard in 2019. 
and that that's put a damper really on on some of what's gone on especially on the floral side part of the interesting thing now is now that some of the pressure is dampened down the the cannabinoid market now you're starting to see a lot more interest in that grain and fiber side which i think in the end will be much larger acreages than than the than the cannabinoid side however there there should be markets for for all three where is vermont in all this i think vermont's a, a really unique state in that they they were in right at the very beginning. Uh, they've historically been known as a niche, localized, uh, high pr- high value uh, producer, right? So they don't have a lot of a lot of farms or very large farms, but they they tend to produce these niche and boutique type products that that have a a, a local following as well as a region following, and and I think. Uh, for the most part, that's where Vermont's at in this as well. So they've seen a, a big drop in acreages, but those producers that were that either got in late or really understood the market have been able to hold on. And I, and I think once they make it through this trough, hopefully they'll see uh, some uptick in that. Can small states compete with bigger states like Kentucky outside of just niche markets? I think you're going to see some some shifting uh, happen as this market continues to mature. So, you know, when when you really look across the country, grain has grown in in areas that have a competitive advantage, right? So, uh, I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the grain go. Uh, fiber is going to be grown in areas that have a competitive advantage in growing fiber. So, I'm really interested in the Kentucky space long term. Uh, Kentucky is a real biomass state because we have a, a very large cattle industry. Uh, so we're the largest cow calf producer east of the Mississippi. So we know how to produce biomass. So if we can get into the fiber side, we've already got that kind of technology piece built in there. So I, I think you are going to see some shifting around that and you're going to see some small states develop some competitive advantages. Um, the, the other piece that kind of goes along with that is, is can you get processors developed? So if you can get some processors developed in this space, even if you're a small state, right? Because if you're hauling grain or fiber, grain, you can probably haul a longer distance. Fiber is going to be really difficult to haul a long distance unless uh, we can do some sort of densification or pre-processing component to, to drop that transportation cost. How are you working with the University of Vermont? Uh, Vermont's been kind of my adopted state here lately uh, within the number of different projects that I uh, have going on with Vermont. So. I've spoken at a couple different conferences with Vermont, uh, and then uh, Jane Kladowski and I have a, a, a project uh, that we're directing. It's a USDA funded project on the economic impact of the hemp industry. So we're really trying to build out what are those economic impact uh, drivers across communities. Heather and I both serve on the uh, S1084, which is a multi-state group of, of hemp academics from across the country. We've been working very closely together. It's kind of a been an interesting uh, uh, marriage, so to speak, between the two areas, uh, given, you know, even when you get into the political space, it's it's kind of an interesting mesh up because you've got a very red state and a very blue state. And, and but, um, you know, it's been it's been a lot of fun to to work with that group there. And, and Vermont has a, a great group, uh, hemp group there uh, put together to to help with. What would you say to a farmer who's been growing hemp for a few years as opposed to someone who wants to get into it. Different advice, same advice, what would you say? I think a lot of my advice is is similar. If you've been in it multiple years, you've gone through some good years and you've gone through some bad years and you've had some contracts that were good and you've had some contracts that were terrible and you're probably still sitting on some product going, how in the world am I gonna get rid of this, right? So you, you kind of understand some of those risks that are in the market. If you're a new producer getting into this, the one good thing is, is over the past couple of years, I haven't, well, since 2019, I haven't had any phone calls telling me that I quit my job, I pulled out my savings and I'm growing hemp. So that's first off, uh, because most of my advice at that point in time was, uh, you need to see if you can get your job back to start. Uh, but um, I, those calls have kind of stopped. Um, but you really need to pay attention to, to the contract you're signing with your processor. Do you understand it? Do you have a contract in place? Can you afford or can you bear the risk? Do you have the wealth in hand to bear the risk if you can't sell this or that processor goes out of business and now you're hung with a crop that could cost anywhere between five and 
fifteen thousand dollars an acre in terms of variable cost just to produce you know really understand the risks that are going on in the market so we've seen all these prices come down at the the farm level and we've seen the price of the product we've seen the price of crude um, broad spectrum full spectrum and isolate prices come down but we really haven't seen it shrink at the retail level so once it gets out into that store so can you sign a contract that allows you to retain some sort of ownership into that retail side so that you don't lose as much money along that chain uh, and are able to, to capture some of those profits. So, you know, I, you know, I, I just really encourage people to, to really think long term about how they're going to play in this and do they have the financing in place to do this because many farmers that jumped into this you know they're they're used to taking their grain once they get it pro, once they get it combined or whatever down the road to the elevator they drop it off and, and a week later a check shows up in the mail right that may not be the case here you may be holding that product for six months nine months a year two years uh to to get that sold and and mm-hmm. can you finance that yeah. um becomes a huge question so those are those are a lot of things that i really like people to think about um you know, if you're going to get in this there. Now I say all that there is money to be made, but you just have to, you have to go into a little different lane of thinking than what we typically do with our traditional commodities. Our thanks to Tyler, Mark and Keith. You can learn more about hemp production in Vermont by visiting the Northwest Crops and Soils website and following the links to their research on industrial hemp listed on the screen. There's a schedule of upcoming webinars, fact sheets, and information for becoming a registered hemp grower in Vermont. And that's our program for today. Thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.